podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. When you think of places where you would want to settle and live in North Carolina, one place you probably would not have on your list is in the middle of a swamp. But for some people, this was the only refuge for them. Jeff Smith found a group of archaeologists who are digging up the past to study these civilizations. If you think your daily commute is rough, these students truly have a journey to get to their workspace. It's basically ticks heat and the occasional fear or spotting of like a, a snake or something. These students are scratching away layers of history, one small scrape at a time. It's a pretty elaborate sort of history that, we, that we're dealing with out here. Uh, my personal interest started with uh, groups of people we call maroons. Uh, that's uh, essentially a, a phrase for people that uh, were enslaved, uh, usually we're speaking of people of African descent, and this process we call it mar uh, maroonage or marinage, if you want to get fancy, uh, it happened where every, wherever slavery existed. What these researchers hope to find on this small patch of dry ground in the middle of the Great Dismal Swamp is a clue into how those groups of people survived in this dangerous and remote location from hundreds of years ago. The archaeology I was expecting to see out there is based in my interest in these uh, sort of 1600, 1700, 1800 resistance communities. So we're located in dry ground uh, in the middle of a huge swamp. Uh, and basically what, what, amounted, what it amounted to was people coming out here and trying to make a living uh, in terms of subsistence, which is you know just finding food, finding ways to shelter themselves, so on and so forth, basic stuff of life um, with swamp materials. These resistance communities began with Native Americans who were forced out of their homeland by English colonists. Eventually, escaped slaves found refuge in the swamp. So from 1610 or so, after the colonial, the colonial sort of really got into the area, cemented themselves, all the way to about 1680. Probably the predominant population that would have come to these kinds of sites in this, in this swamp uh, were indigenous Americans. Then from about 1680 to about 1720, 1730, we expect uh, formerly enslaved people of African descent, Maroons coming in, probably joining with uh, indigenous Americans who were living here already and learning the ways of the swamp among each other. Dr. Dan Sayers is heading this research team of students from American University okay. as they locate what life in the swamp was like. Yeah, well, when Dr. Sayers approached us about wanting to do the archaeology research out here, um, we look at it from sort of a compatibility uh, standpoint. Um, is it compatible with the refuge purpose? And it is because, again, we protect natural resources but also cultural resources. So we looked at his proposal and we said, wow, this would be really beneficial information to have. Archaeologists aren't just interested in the stuff. They are interested in the landscapes people create. Um, so we also develop predictive sort of models for the kinds of architecture, uh, the kinds of alterations people would make to dry ground in the swamp, so gardens, um, what kinds of pits would they dig, storage, fire pits. This research is not about pulling large chunks of pottery or silverware that was used by marooned residents. This lack of large-scale artifacts is due to the people being closed off from the outside world and the need to reuse any and all goods they may have brought with them into the swamp. A European mentality, generally speaking at the time, throughout the colonial period and up through even perhaps somewhat to the present, places like swamps were forbidden. They were foreboding, right? They were haunted. They were places where you got deathly sick, uh, so on and so forth. And so a swamp like this, right, the, that colonial mentality kept it somewhat, not, I don't know how to put it, but safe from development. As each student and researcher digs another centimeter below the surface, they are looking for small bits of materials, but just as important to find is small discolorations in the soil. This may look like a shadow to you, but the darker soil color represents a location where someone had disturbed the ground to locate a structure or garden. So make sure you mark that. It's going to be its own bag, right, and get all the information that you normally put on a level bag. Okay. But the depth you, ha you found it at, because okay. it's in your plan, right. just get that on there. Yep, we'll get that all on there. Yep. Last year as we were uh, excavating, we had um, several students up here doing some shovel test pits, and we came down on a ceramic sherd. Um, when 
we brought that down and investigated that shirt further, uh, we found more in what is a post hole. Uh, after expanding that unit, we then saw this trench feature here, uh, which led us to believe that this is a larger architectural feature. Um, so we believe there to be more post holes along here. Um, but what we're trying to do is just get a, a view of what that, how that structure is running uh, before we do any uh, more excavation into it, into any more uh, post holes. In the course of this project, I think this is probably the 30th lead shot we found. Um, remember, this stuff would have been very precious too. Um, so if we find it in the ground, it meant it was, you know, sort of unfortunately dropped. We know George Washington was here in 1763. We know that um, slaves uh, escaped and came through the swamp. In fact, in 2005, we were designated part of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. We know that that, you know, that people came through the swamp. We don't know w if people lived here, to what extent they lived here, what type of activities, and that's what this research gives us. It's tiny, well, it's a slightly different color from the rest of the stuff in the screen. So usually when I screen, I look for um, differences in color or texture. Burnt clay is a lot um, harder than regular dirt, but a lot of times, you know, I mistake it for dirt. <laughs> Dr. Sayers began bringing students into the Great Dismal Swamp in 2008. The refuge covers over 112,000 acres in southwestern Virginia and northeastern North Carolina. Each summer, the field research team builds on the previous research and continues to look at regions of higher ground where civilizations could have survived. Our hope for the future with a, with a visitor center, like a larger visitor center, that we can then display some of these items. Uh, they're all being cataloged right now. They're all being um, preserved. And so if we, once we have the facilities to be able to display some of these items and get some interpretive exhibits out there, do presentations, put a, um, like a teacher's workbook together about the history of the swamp and the, and the culture, the significance um, of, these, of what the findings out here, uh, that's what we hope to do in, in the end. Since the research team is continuing to do the field digs, the exact location of the findings is not disclosed to protect against disturbances of the artifacts and soil. To learn more about the history of the Great Dismal Swamp, check out our website at unctv.org slash ncnow. Click on the web link for the Swamp Refuge. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.